for tuning in today. I'm Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 70s, and we're here today to talk about winter houseplant care. And um, since we're heading in towards the holiday season, I also want to talk about uh, some basic care on some of those holiday gift plants or traditional holiday decor plants like poinsettias and Christmas cactus and a few others. <clears throat> the, the reason why we really specialize um, a separate class on winter houseplant care versus just our basic houseplant care classes is because there are some unique differences in how plants um, respond and how they grow during this time of year. So um, there is a separate handout that uh, will be attached uh, to this video after we're finished with the video. So we're a little bit um, behind schedule this week, but it'll come in afterwards. The, the basics is that the basics are that we want to talk about some like do's and don'ts. Um, and I don't usually break it down into so uh, definable cut and dry, you know, black and whites, do's and don'ts. So understand that uh, rules are meant for breaking, <clears throat> but we all like to at least kind of establish a baseline of, um, as I often call them, best practices, right? So our do's and don'ts are our best practices baseline for winter indoor plant care. Now, um, to address what is winter indoors, um, you know, I run the heat and my plants don't know it. Um, that's not true. So it's, it's winter uh, in the house because the light has shifted significantly by the sun uh, setting in the southern part of the horizon, so really kind of changing the angle from the sky. Of course, the daylight itself, uh, the length of daylight has decreased, and in especially the Pacific Northwest, um, the quality of our light is also often um, mitigated by clouds or, um, you know, on and off showers, whatever, um, whatever weather throws at us. So the the fact of the matter is the plants that are tropical and growing in our homes still realize that it is winter and that the seasons have changed. So from the month of October all the way through the month of February, uh, those months represent the winter dormancy or kind of winter season for our indoor plants. And so during those months, we want to apply these kind of winter um, plant care best practices as much as we can. The um, thing also about this time of year is, you know, we are running heaters, possibly more. Um, we might be home more uh, during the evening with lights on, so maybe we close curtains or close shutters or whatever. It's important we remember in the daylight to open our curtains, open our shutters as much as possible to allow natural sunlight, natural light into our homes. And as we're running heaters, um, radiators, fireplaces, wood stoves, all of those things, the, um, the moisture in the air is affected by those uh, climate control techniques. Um, so like radiators, I understand, give out moist heat, so that may be nice for your plants, but um, a basic forced air furnace, for example, is gonna dry out the air. I often notice, you know, my skin is dry in the winter. I look for chapstick or I put lotion on more often. Um, those are all signals to me that my indoor air uh, is drier in my home, and so I need to consider that it's also been drier for my plants and increase the humidity. So. With all of those things kind of, um, you know, acknowledged, some of those various factors, changes in available light, as I mentioned, cold drafts from windows uh, or frequently used doors. You know, if you have a plant that's near a door that's open and closed all the time, it's getting exposed to cold drafts. Um, hot air or, you know, fireplace air, those kinds of things. And then the last thing that often happens um, unintentionally to our house plants during the holidays is we may move them to make room for the Christmas tree, for example, or for holiday decor or re um, just kind of 
reconfiguration, you know, especially coming into Thanksgiving and, and the holidays during COVID, I mean, we have to space everybody out so that we can have socially distanced meals um, throughout the house. So every time we move a plant um, for, uh, you know, a week to three weeks, we've changed its pretty much its whole world. Um, even though we think we've just moved it across the room, um, you might as well have moved it to a new planet. So uh, depending on the plant, some plants have a harder time adjusting to that kind of a change. And in most cases where we moved that plant may not have been to the best place for it. It probably is being moved into the corner of a room or away from a window rather than being moved towards a window. So consider that, um, you know, we've just put it into a, a worse uh, a worse scenario or a worse environment for it. And let's make sure again that that move is temporary. So uh, with all of those kinds of factors, as I said, you know, addressed or acknowledged, going into do's and don'ts, um, we just kind of take that take that with um, whatever uh, take take it with those factors in mind. So dues are first off watering less frequently. Um, it is important that we begin to back away on our regular summer watering pattern to uh, to acknowledge that our plants are using less water as they're growing slower and only water the plants when they need it. Um, and I know that that sounds obvious, but uh, we are always encouraging our uh, houseplant customers to consider leaving the plants that they purchase in a plastic container. So in the nursery pot that they're grown in, uh, there's various sizes, so they can be sized up when it's appropriate. But leaving them in their plastic container allows us to gauge the weight of the plant, which will tell us a lot about how much moisture is actually in the soil. So waiting until the plant feels lightweight before watering it, and then of course checking a few other sig signals. Uh, for example, I can look at the underside of the container, and not only does this nerve plant feel lightweight, but we can see that the soil on the underside is lighter in color and dry looking. If the soil in the bottom were dark and still even a little bit of moisture that I could feel uh, with my fingers, I may wait uh, to water this plant. Now a uh, nerve plant or a petonia is one of those plants that will just lay out flat in a total drama fit when it goes dry. So this is not a difficult plant to gauge when it needs watering and when it uh, does not. So it's right at a perfect stage now though. It feels dry enough to the touch and looks like the roots have had a chance to dry out before I water it again, but it is not splayed out flat and given me a total wilt, which it's, although not the worst thing that can happen to a plant as long as you can revive it quickly or uh, rehydrate it, wilting to that point over and over again for a plant is stressful and can cause a little bit of leaf damage um, even potentially who knows if that's why you know it may go, go into flower but this little plant starting to bloom and sometimes even like putting out a flower is a response to stress um, so we don't want to let it go completely to like wilting every time before we water it but it's not the end of the world if a plant does tell you, hey, I just hit my limit, um, we just need to pay attention and water it a day or two before that limit gets hit the next time around. So the little plastic containers can be dropped into a more decorative pot. And of course, this time of year, um, you know, cute little metal tins, cookie tins, this is just like uh, a little plaid, you know, bucket or pail. We could take that plastic container, drop it right down in there, and this will be fun on the kitchen counter or somewhere where it, you know, again, is more holiday decor. You have that fun pink and a little bit of the plaid. Uh, and then we take it out to the hole in the bottom of this container. It doesn't need drainage as long as we're removing the plant to water and put it back in that pot. So watering less often and when the plant needs
needs it is critical. Uh, and by the time we get into the <coughs> kind of um, you know height of winter, you're watering about less. Excuse me. You're watering about half as often as you were watering your plants in the peak of summer. So peak of winter, about half as frequently as in the peak of summer. <clears throat> now, also not a bad idea to water your plants with room temperature water, um, or at least kind of, you know, not freezing cold out of the tap. It's probably getting colder and colder um, in the house even, so it can just be kind of a shock for plants when they're watered with um, really cold water. So I just fill my watering cans every time I empty them and just let them sit until the next time I need to um, use them. That also allows some chlorine to dissipate in the air, um, a little bit of off-gassing of you know, chlorine in the waters and things. So just fill your watering cans and let them come to room temperature. That way when you do water, um, it's already there. Now, Increasing humidity, so again, moisture, but not necessarily moisture taken up by the roots of the plant. Air humidity, moisture in the air, can help plants to kind of balance their moisture uptake needs from their roots. And as I mentioned, the air in our homes gets drier and drier um, with certain types of heating uh, that we use. So there are obviously a lot of different techniques that we can use to increase humidity. Um, and one of them will be just to like purchase and run a humidifier. Um, the other obvious way to increase humidity is to use a mister. So uh, this is a plant, this is a plant mister by Delta. It's one of the, um, one of my favorite misters that we sell and I forgot to fill it with water so I can't really demonstrate what it does. But it, it really creates a very fine mist, not a real wet particle mist, but a very fine, fine spray. And it also kind of, um, uh, once you've built up a little bit of a spray, it gives you a continuous spray without having to constantly uh, squeeze the trigger. So I don't know if I'm explaining it well, but I think this has been out on the market a, a while and you know, long enough that many of us are familiar with it. A fine, fine spray gets less like actual water on like your furniture and your walls and your carpet and things, but more fine water that kind of clings onto the plants, um, giving them that little extra pocket of humidity. Now to really be effective in increasing the humidity around your indoor plants with misting, it needs to be something that you are fairly dedicated to. Um, in reality, a minimum of twice a day is what you would need to do to mist your plants twice a day in order to really give them enough humidity to make a difference. So for me, that's a lot of effort that I'm just not able to deliver uh, with my schedule and my lifestyle. So not a realistic situation for me. Um, and that leaves me with a hum humidifier, physical misting, or what we call a pebble tray. And a pebble tray is an excellent way to increase humidity around plants that really appreciate high humidity. So here are three lovely humidity loving examples of uh, calathea. So we have three different types of calathea. You know everybody loves calathea and they're so pretty and they're so bright and colorful. <coughs> excuse me, that they're really hard to resist. But the drier our indoor air, the harder it is for Calathea to keep these gorgeous looking leaves looking gorgeous. So even on this one, we see a little bit of kind of a crispy brown tip at the edges, possibly just a little bit too dry. I mean, I'm not saying 100% that's what happened here, but that often happens when our Calathea are in too dry of air. So a pebble tray is where Let's see, now I'll take a couple of these out so you can see what I'm talking about. A pebble tray is just using a regular saucer or even a tray. You could use like a cafeteria tray. You could use um, something, you know, really fancy. This is not fancy at all. This is a plastic saucer for a, you know, outdoor pot. And at the bottom of this plastic saucer, you want it to be deep enough, at least, a, you know, inch and a half or so deep. 
At the bottom of the saucer, I have put a layer of um, whatever I could find, and this happens to be these little glass beads today. Um, you could use pebbles, um, you could use uh, probably wine corks even. You want the things that you use to be at least like M&M size or peanut M&M size, or even larger, so that there's some space between the items in the bottom of the tray and the space is where water is going to evaporate out of. So we have our material in the tray, uh, I don't know, half an inch thick. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then I'm going to fill the bottom of the tray with water, just regular tap water, right up to the bottom of my shiny pebbles. And then plants are going to sit on top of the shiny pebbles. They're not in the water, and we want to make sure that they're not actually sitting in water, because that's not what we want. Mm -hmm. But as they sit on this tray, the water in the pebbles will slowly evaporate. And that evaporation of water around the plants on top of this tray will create a pocket of humidity around them. And then you'll just refill that tray as it uh, loses water to keep it kind of at that just below the rocks level. Now this is a passive humidity um, source that can really help stabilize plants and their moisture needs as well as do the job of a humidifier or misting uh, without having to, you know, physically remember to be there as long as you can fill the tray. So increasing humidity for your humidity loving plants can make a significant impact in their well-being in the wintertime. But this type of setup would not be suggested for something like a succulent or even a snake plant um, or a ZZ plant. So those plants would prefer to be on the dry side. Even when they're actively growing, they are water thrifty and low water plants. So when they are dormant, we need to make sure that they are um, really given low water. So that would not be something we would want to get high humidity. So um, <laughs> rotate plants regularly, regularly to encourage balanced growth. Now rotating plants um, is, is like this, right? Giving them a little bit of a turn because most plants live near a window, but probably not near multiple windows which means that they kind of zero in on their light source and then grow more uh, focused in that direction. So if the window is this direction, not only will the plant grow fuller on this side, it may slightly grow towards the light and even the foliage that you see, if the leaves were, you know, are supposed to be like this because sunlight comes from above, a plant that realizes that its light source is um, kind of singularly located will even kind of shift its leaves to maximize their solar power potential to that light source. So giving the plant a regular turn is going to keep it balanced and growing uh, in all direct, kind of from all sides and more of a balanced growth um, symmetry wise than allowing it to kind of um, get misshapen or wander off towards the source of light. So uh, if you, you know, once a, once a week or every time you water, if you give your plant kind of a quarter turn, that helps to keep it balanced instead of waiting until it's already um, in need of turning and then you've got something that might be um, off balance in the first place and then it falls off the windowsill or something like that. So rotate them regularly. Now, rotating uh, round, round this way also may mean that you might need to rotate plants into the south window or rotate plants throughout your house into rooms that give brighter light. And if you can't put all your plants in those rooms, you may need to cycle through those plants on a weekly basis. So, you know, today all the succulents move into the south window, um, but all of the philodendron get to move over into the east window. So um, if you see plants struggling, it's not a bad idea to give them extra light. Always remember though, 
light. Um, you could give them supplemental light as well. So plug in an LED plant light, <coughs> go with a seed starting light, or something that's going to give them again that light right where they are instead of um, moving them somewhere to give them the light from the windows. Now, some plants just don't like to move. If you have a ficus, a fig, especially the fiddle leaf figs or the weeping figs, the ficus benjamina, anytime those plants get moved, even from one side of the room to the other, they're going to do a, a, a leaf drop for approximately two weeks or so. So it's kind of readjusting to their new environment. Every day they'll drop several leaves on the ground or a leaf or two on the ground. And um, that causes a lot of, you know, plant moms and dads to panic as we're sweeping up leaves. But as the plant adjusts to its new location, if it, um, you know, only does that leaf drop for about two weeks and then reacclimates, then that is to be expected. If the leaf drop continues and the plant is, you know, really going downhill, um, then you may have, of course, you know, moved it to a worse location or, you know, maybe it's getting a heat source, um, hot air from a heater or, or uh, you know, cold draft or something else that's causing those leaf drops. So, again, look at the whole um, environment that you've moved the plant to, especially if it's not doing well. But don't be surprised, like, know your plants and don't be surprised if one does kind of a, if it's in the ficus family, if it does a little bit of a drama fit, uh, once it gets moved, it probably thinks you're going to kill it. Um, and as once, like, it figures out you're not going to kill it, it'll calm down and, and stop its, like, freak out. So um, they are drama queens, all of those things. <clears throat> now, because we are uh, watering less frequently and, you know, moving plants to the corner to make room for family and the Christmas tree and all of that, it doesn't mean that we can ignore them or forget about them. And that's really important because, um, well, part of why we have them is because we love them and we want to celebrate every leaf. Um, and so go ahead and continue to um, Instagram the new growth and, you know, get excited about um, all of the offshoots that you have. But um, the although you are watering less frequently, it's still really important to just inspect and check on your plants as regularly as possible. And once again, um, I know in my house, as soon as the heater starts running, like air picks up dust and suddenly there's dust on my leaves and my plants look dusty. So the need to clean them is kind of um, the way that like we hang out, you know, now when I'm, um, inspecting my plants and instead of watering them I'm going to just dust up the leaves, rotate them, check on new growth, and at the same time make sure that they don't have any pests, make sure that nothing is looking funky, and um, if there's a yellow leaf or two I can remove it. If it was kind of down low on the plant or somewhere near the inside of the plant I'm not surprised. I don't have like a plant funeral or freak out, you know, again, like panic because it's lost a leaf. It is a natural creature that is going to have a natural, like a certain degree of natural dieback. And an old yellow leaf, like low down or inside the plant, just didn't have a lot to give anymore. Not only that, but it wasn't even in a spot where it had a lot to gain. So the plant just cut it loose. And, you know, again, we need to <clears throat> learn the acceptable levels of just like natural life that our houseplants exhibit, as well as, you know, treat them like, um, you know, models and cover girls and those kinds of things. So we can't always expect them to be perfect, um, they're plants, um, and they are alive. So they're gonna have their like, I don't know, good days and bad days. Um, cleaning, so neem oil or any kind of oil and just like a gentle cloth, is your basic maintenance for cleaning. Um, a little, again, you could use your mister to get the leaves wet. You could use a, a you know, regular sized 
uh, garden shed style bottle like Midex here that we have or little smaller kind of under the cupboard size bottles. This is insecticidal soap. Either one of these are great to clean the plant's leaves with yet at the same time be preventatively working on any potential infestation. So many of us know spider mites um, may already be lurking in your um, citrus that you just brought in because of the cold weather or um, a conifer that you know you have just cut some needles off of to bring into the or you know boughs to bring into the house so it's potential that insects come from just about anywhere um, and keeping our plants safe from them includes kind of a constant vigilance so now when that involves cleaning them on a regular basis you can use a nice soft cloth the oil, Midex is an oil base, so rather than spraying the plant and maybe getting spray on my walls or my furniture, I'm gonna spray the cloth a couple of times, just until I can see it's moist, and then I'm gonna just wipe the leaf down with that nice moist cloth, both on the top and on the bottom. And not only does that get rid of the dust, but it also then is giving them that kind of preventative wipe down for any possible pests like spider mites, mealybugs, those kinds of things. So preventative um, and restorative, and it just makes them look good, um, is always that kind of, you know, how you, how you, uh, what, what there is to do with your plants at this time of year. Um, now you can also take them into the shower um, or into the sink and give them a gentle stream of water over the foliage to wash it off but uh, you definitely want to avoid over watering and so if you've got a plant that um, needs a showering but doesn't need a drink try to cover the foliage either wrap it up in a garbage bag or you know put the, the soil into a plastic bag just shower off the leaves themselves or again just do um, you know by hand with a soft cloth instead if you also um, let a plant go pretty dry in between waterings. So here again, we've got our nice anthurium. Uh, this is a gorgeous flowering indoor tropical plant that happens to be, you know, in red, so it looks great for the winter months or winter holidays. But anthuriums, um, we want to go nice and dry between watering, and you can see, you know, now I can just barely lift it with a couple of fingers. So that tells us that it's nice and dry. But once soil goes really dry, occasionally it kind of pulls away from the edges of the pot um, and gets hard and sort of crusty and makes it even more difficult when we water. The water may kind of roll off of the top of the soil and just down and out. And then when you lift the plant, it may not feel like any of that water actually made it into the soil. So if that's the case, uh, we can either bottom water, so actually setting the plant down into a basin of water will allow it to get moisture from the holes in the bottom of the pot and kind of pull it up uh, into the soil that way. <clears throat> but if you use just a little, a simple like chopstick or a pencil um, or even like a barbecue skewer, bamboo skewer, you can poke a few holes just vertically straight down into the soil. And of course you want to do it gently enough that if you run into a root, you can like back out. But see, I went all the way down and out even a bottom hole here. So one, we can do maybe four to six, just nice, gentle holes down into the soil. Oh, I hit a root, so I'll back out, try over here. And by doing these kind of aeration holes, that's gonna allow both air and water to move back more freely through the soil when we water. And the next time we water, we won't see it crust up on the top and roll over. It'll penetrate into the soil and we'll feel that moisture have been kind of absorbed by the, um, by the roots and the soil and the roots. So do's, do's, do's. Those are all do's. Uh, and do avoid cold drafts from windows or frequently used doors, as I mentioned. Um, don'ts. Here's the don'ts. I know that it seems unfair that we say 
don't mess around a lot with your houseplants this time of year. I mean, you've just pretty much been chased indoors by cold and rainy weather, and now you don't have your outdoor garden so much to work in. But this is not the ideal time to repot all of your houseplants, to like propagate all of your houseplants, um, make cuttings for your friends for Christmas. None of this is really the right time to do uh, all of those things. So repotting should wait until the plants begin actively growing again. And now it's uh, from October through February, we want to let the plants rest and that includes not repotting them. It's not, uh, it's very infrequent that you would buy a brand new plant at a garden center and it need to be repotted right away. So something like this little Fetonia, the Nerf plant, could easily uh, wait until March to be repotted um, and would be better off that way. So if we repot during the dormant months, often the plant doesn't move into that space. Um, and so all that extra soil just sits and holds more moisture than the plant wanted, uh, leading usually to overwatering. It's uh, also not time to fertilize. So most plants have made all of the nutrients that they need plus even a little bit extra and they're storing that so that they can draw off of those reserves during kind of the leaner months of winter. So they've got reserves that they need to basically draw down on um, and if we fertilize during this time of year we often may see a fertilizer burn or just a nutrient um, imbalance or an excess of um, nutrients that create even like little brown tips or, or uh, fertilizer burn at the ends of leaves. So um, back off on fertilizing, winter is not for fertilizing. You could give a uh, top dressing of something like worm castings or water in your plants with worm tea or compost tea or use a very, very, very diluted organic fertilizer um, that is more like a catalyst for the nutrients that are in the soil. So even something like, um, we sell a, a, a product called Joyful Dirt here um, that is one of the few that I would say you could use when necessary during this time of year because it doesn't push a lot of growth on plants. It's more about um, feeding the soil. So, um, but leave the fertilizing uh, until the active growing months. and. The last don't is just like, don't expect a lot of growth from your plants. Don't expect to see a lot of change. Um, the blooms that are gonna happen are gonna be predictable. You know, if it's a Christmas cactus, a Thanksgiving cactus, and you've done all of the uh, advanced work to get it to bloom, it, it, it's gonna bloom. Um, but I wouldn't expect uh, things that aren't necessarily, you know, like a African violet, unless you are able to provide additional light, uh, your African violet is probably not going to come into bloom this time of year in lower light conditions. So um, don't expect a ton of growth. Um, and if you see, if you have succulents, for example, like uh, Echeveria, the kind of blue or plum colored uh, foliage succulents or brightly colored plants, the lower the light, um, that those plants have, the, the less intense their color will be. So that's also something to kind of focus on or address is if it seems like your plants are losing their, um, their flair, losing their color, then um, giving them brighter light or even supplemental light from uh, an additional plant light can bring the right colors back um, as well. So just, you know, uh, don't don't put up with lackluster plants when they could be bright and colorful if you just gave them a little bit more light. So colors, um, and again, you know, holiday decor with plants. I mean, obviously there is the poinsettia um, that is oh so popular and most of us, you know, are given one or more every year. It's a little early in the season and unfortunately I don't yet have a poinsettia to show, um, but really the, the trick with those plants uh, is first of all they're cold sensitive, 
we don't want to let a poinsettia get too uh, dry, but we also don't want it to sit in water. So using that plastic pot, kind of lifting it, if it feels heavy, I'm going to wait to water it until it feels a little bit lighter, but not, you know, uh, so far that it goes dry and the leaves start to turn yellow and kind of crispy. A lot of times poinsettias are given to us in uh, like a foil, decorative foil or cellophane liner or sleeve. And it's important that we take that out of the sleeve um, and, and water the plant and let the plant drain through uh, and then kind of drip dry before we put it back into that little sleeve that holds a lot of moisture around the roots and doesn't let them really dry out as quickly. Also, uh, if you're if you've recently moved here from a warmer climate, perhaps the Bay Area, for example, I understand that in warmer climates, people put their poinsettias out on their front porch or front stoop or doorstep. Don't do that here. Um, it is way too cold for your poinsettia. And so um, in most cases, we kind of quickly get you from the store to your car and then quickly from your car to the home um, where the plant can go uh, from warmth to warmth to warmth with very little time in the cold. They're also um, water sensitive. So, you know, they're from Mexico. It doesn't usually rain where they live. So the, um, the foliage of a poinsettia, which is actually the bright colored uh, part, so the red or the really colorful part is really a, just a colorful leaf that can spot and get a little bit damaged in um, with water on it so we want to keep those dry and even when you water either just water the soil or set them down into a basin and let them soak up water from below now there are a lot of you know fun ways to decorate during the holidays as i mentioned you know these cute little this looks like a bag but it's a cement um it's pretty heavy but a cement little container or your little kind of uh, decorative tins. Boxes of all kinds, just a little wooden box with an amaryllis in it. Be creative if you've got a little tin uh, or if you have this container here. For example, we wanna put an adorable little indoor uh, evergreen or Christmas tree type guy in it. This is a Norfolk Island pine. But if we drop it in there, it looks kind of small and stupid. So this time of year, often we have a lot of packaging on hand. I mean, let's face it, we always have a lot of packaging on hand in most cases. So using a couple of pieces of styrofoam, styrofoam because it doesn't get damaged when it's wet, we'll drop maybe two little blocks of styrofoam and see, I don't know, one might be, one more is probably too tall. Oh, that's not too bad. So there's a little bit of styrofoam in here. And you could also pack a little bit of moss in there just to give it a little bit of stability. But that brings the height up and shows off the plant a lot better than if it were dropped down into the bottom. Maybe one less is better. We can tuck that little styrofoam around the edge and then cover it with some moss and it's all cute for the holidays. Or taking your regular regular plants like a peace lily and whatever she was in you know whatever container it was in just dressing it up with a fancy a little bit of gold or a brighter container for the holidays can also make you know you can look new or give it another you know a new outfit for a different season <clears throat> and then one of the um, other popular plants that we see gifted or hostess type plants or just um, seasonal blooming uh, decor plants for this time of year are the Thanksgiving cactus, Christmas cactus. Um, we kind of collectively refer to them as zygo cactus, which uh, actually is because there are ones that bloom at various holidays. So Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter as well. Um, but they come in a range of colors, usually come kind of pastels. Uh, I think this, I don't even know what color this is, like peachy, apricot mango color almost. 
so pretty. A little bit more unusual, um, but the range of colors is from, you know, bright fuchsia to a soft pink to a red, there's white. The zygo cactus, um, longevity and kind of ease of care is one of the things that makes them so popular. I mean, a poinsettia is going to be given to every, you know, pretty much everybody every year, but most of us then throw them away. Um, so a poinsettia for a holiday tradition is a temporary plant. But in a lot of cases, the Christmas cactus, Thanksgiving cactus are, first of all, they can live for a hundred years and they are, they're in the succulent family. So they are easy, easy going, they're low maintenance and can grow in lower light. They're just not likely to give you very much bloom in low light. So brighter light will give them better flowering. Um, but the ease of care on them does allow uh, more often than not them to be kept from year after year. So you want to treat them similar to a succulent or a cactus. And again, your handout's going to have some good information on how to care for them, how to water them. Um, but you want to let at least the top half of the soil or, you know, 50% of the top soil go dry between watering. So you can feel, again, the weight. This guy is too heavy um, to be watered again. And I can even see the soil is damp to look at and uh, it's wet looking even on the bottom. So for sure, this is not ready to be watered again. But often you'll see the zygo cactus available in very small containers. So the smaller the pots, the more likely they'll need to be watered more frequently. We can see that the soil is lighter in color, also lighter on the bottom of the container, and it's lightweight um, or very, you know, very light to the touch. In fact, it's top heavy, um, as you can see. So it's covered in little flower buds on the top. We don't want those flower buds to get too dry or they will drop off. And anytime the plant is in bloom, you want to avoid, again, um, repotting or um, really disturbing it too much. So this time of year, normally we would be repotting and specifically because it's in bloom or budded, we don't need to be, we don't want to be repotting. Also doesn't need to be fertilized at this time of year. Um, but during the spring and summer, you can give it just a basic all purpose fertilizer at half strength. So always dilute it down. <clears throat> the temperature is what causes the Christmas cactus or zygo cactus to set their flower buds. So depending on the times of year, a lot of people will put them out onto a covered or protected porch or patio during spring and summer, and then bring them in uh, towards the end of summer or before we get to that average first frost, protecting them from winter cold. And at the same time, that change for them in temperatures is often what has caused the buds to set um, to bloom on schedule. So it's all their kind of standard life cycle which allows them to set their flowers and come into bloom on a regular basis. The kind of common knowledge is that poinsettias, um, which again, as I mentioned, are like the most traditional holiday decor plant, uh, that they are toxic. And poinsettias do have a degree of toxicity that, um, for pets and children, if they ate the foliage, can cause vomiting, um, nausea, but it's also very, very bitter. And so it's not likely, um, once it's been kind of tasted or sampled, most critters aren't gonna go back for another sample. The um, non-toxic alternatives, if you, you know, wanna just be on the safe side for holiday flowers um, and decor will be all of the zygocactus. So they are completely non-toxic. Um, and then one other common holiday decor plant that we see uh, at this time of year is a uh, calancho. So calanchos are often what we see at the, like, at the checkout stand at Safeway or whatever is a little calancho in a, you know, cellophane or whatever, and you grab it and bring it to the hostess. 
This one happens to be like an orange color, but again, they come in reds and whites and pinks um, and a range of colors. Calanchos are also a succulent, big, thick, succulent leaf. So similar to the zygocactus, you can feel that they are thrifty with water and they don't need to be watered very often. Calanchos are now also often being combined with poinsettias. Um, so this is like a little double calancho with kind of like a rosebud looking flower. But the calanchos are being combined with poinsettias and the two are potted together in a kind of a newer holiday plant that's being referred to as a calcetia. So calancho and the setia for the poinsettia. Um, and they're just fun. It's kind of a fun new combination of, um, of just a different look. But Calancho are highly toxic. So whereas the poinsettias are relatively toxic, calancho are highly toxic. So again, um, if those are always concerns for you, or if you're going to have plants on, you know, dining room tables, buffets, end caps, places where there's access to it by um, children or near food or you know whatever, and you have concerns about uh, curious family members, um, then go with something such as the psychocactus, which is always going to be your safe bet and non-toxic. Um, and then these items that are more toxic could either be left to um, admire at other people's homes or, you know, out of reach and um, keeping everyone safer. With that being said, <laughs> um, I just again uh, think that there's always <clears throat> room for more plants at home. Um, so if you are um, finding yourself drawn to the plant department wherever you go, adding plants to your home for the holidays, even if they aren't seasonal holiday plants, just makes the house feel um, warmer, brighter, more homey. Um, of course, <clears throat> we all know that plants have a um, emotional and psychological effect on us that kind of helps us with Home, a sense of calm and well-being, more creativity, better sleep. Um, I'm just gonna say it raises your sex drive. It's not proven, but you know, whatever. Um, and so, with all that being said, um, come on in and take a look at some of the amazing houseplants that we have, uh, both on a regular basis as well as seasonal plants that are coming in this time of year. Uh, and next week, we will really focus on paper whites and amaryllis, which are the potted indoor bulbs that we often use to decorate and um, grow during the holiday season. And I'll probably have poinsettias on hand at that point, so I may revisit um, a poinsettia again next week when I have one to actually look at and show, and um, it's a little bit easier to talk about. So if there are questions from today's class, uh, please put them into the comment section, and if I haven't already answered them, I will answer them afterwards. The handout will be posted. Hope you all learned something again today, and as always, thanks for watching. Happy gardening.